Hello, and welcome to World Canvas from the International Programs at the University of Iowa. I'm Joan Kerr, and we're happy to have you with us for this program focusing on genetics and new technologies. World Canvas is coming to you from the Senate Chamber of the Old Capitol Museum. This program is being recorded for statewide television and radio distribution over UITV and KRUI 89.7. It will also be available along with all programs in the series as a free podcast on iTunes. I'd like to thank our production partners, UITV, the Pentecrest Museums, KRUI, and Information Technology Services. The study of genetics has come a long way since Gregor Mendel's groundbreaking work with pea plants in the mid-19th century. Tonight, we're hoping to see just how far we've come and where research into genetics is taking us. At this point in the 21st century, entire genomes have been sequenced, including the human genome, and the resulting knowledge has led to an explosion of scientific and medical specialties, advances in the research and treatment of innumerable diseases, and genetic testing that can help parents and patients negotiate problematic diagnoses or put their minds at ease. New technologies have enabled more and more specialized research, which pushes technological developments forward as multidisciplinary collaborations produce new inquiries and spur new thinking. At the same time that this brave new scientific world holds so much promise for so many, individuals and societies find themselves wrestling with previously unheard of ethical and legal dilemmas. Our exceptional panel tonight will help us understand the research world we live in today, examining what's been made possible by new technologies, and discussing how genetic analysis of cancer is helping develop targeted treatments, treatments which can be delivered to patients based on the genetics of their particular cancer. We'll learn about genetic screenings for newborns, the critical research roles played by the basic sciences, and professional fields like engineering, and what it takes to move clinical research into patient care. We also confront emerging ethical and legal issues related to both genetics and new technologies and the choices many will be forced to make for themselves or their loved ones in coming years. So we have a lot to cover and we'll begin with the three gentlemen who are here on stage with me. Uh, before we get into our conversations with them, I want to mention to those listening that genetics and bioinformatics are explicitly interdisciplinary on this campus. They're not standalone programs and um, uh, they're technically housed here in the graduate college. So um, the folks here with me on the stage are Tom Casavant, just next to me, a professor of electrical and computer and um, also biomedical engineering and genetics, uh, director of the UI Center for Bioinformatics and Computational Biology, associate director of bioinformatics at the Holden Comprehensive Cancer Center. Welcome, Tom. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, next to him is Benjamin Darbro, Assistant Professor of Pediatrics and Genetics and a Director of the University of Iowa's Human Cytogenetics Lab in Pediatrics. So thanks for being here, Ben. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And John Logsdon is our third guest, and he's a UI Associate Professor of Biology and Genetics in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and thank you, John. Thanks for having me. An additional thank you to you, because you also are the uh, overseer of this beautiful building that we're in, the old Capitol and the Pentecost Museum. So thank you for giving us this space. Always glad to have World Canvas in the center chamber. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think I'm going to start with you, Ben, if you don't mind. I wonder if you could sort of lead us into this discussion of genetics and new technologies by giving us an overview of the research world we live in these days. Oh, certainly. Um, you know, I think it's... It, uh, Probably a fitting uh, opening to sort of put it in perspective. Uh, a little over 10 years ago, the Human Genome Project was completed. It took about 10 years and it uh, cost about $3.2 billion. And we found out what our genetic code was at about 3.2 billion uh, uh, positions. To give you some context, we can now do the exact same thing uh, for about $5,000 in a matter of days. So the technology has uh, jumped in leaps and bounds uh, faster, actually, than most any of us would have uh, predicted when the Human Genome Project was finished. Uh, but that said, we've actually been doing whole genome work for well over 40 years. Um, I'm a, a clinical cytogeneticist. I look at chromosomes under the microscope, what some would call sort of old school these days. Um, but we've been doing that for over 40 years. The only difference between what we've been able to do then and now is how clearly we can see the picture. Uh, before, we could basically just see chromosomes, which for those of you who may have eyes like mine, if you take your glasses off and look at something, everything is very blurry. But you can still sort of make things out. That's what our view of the human genome was about 40 years ago. Now it's as if we have an electron microscope and we can see every last little detail. 
Uh, but the challenge is just being able to see the human genome doesn't know we know, mean that we know what it does. And that's really our largest challenge right now, is interpreting what it does. And in fact, my job and my research focuses only on 2% of the human genome. And that takes me anywhere from days to weeks to months to interpret one individual's 2% of their genome, let alone the entire 98% of the rest of it. Um, and these are for individuals who are actually suffering from genetic disorders, as opposed to healthy individuals, um, which is what a lot of the uh, publicity has been about whole genome sequencing these days. Um, some of the technologies that you've probably heard about, whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, chromosomal microarrays, uh, these are all designed to give us a better look at the human genome, a better look at all 3.2 billion A, T, Cs, and Gs that make us all who we are today. Uh, but one thing I'll kind of maybe close on here as an introduction is just, the, despite the fact that we all are about 99.6% the same, and that number changes almost every day, and it gets lower and lower, but there is still about anywhere from 30 to 50 billion or a million base pairs that separate all of us. And as I think we can all account, you know, attest to, that, that speaks uh, volumes. I mean, we're all different at about 50 million base pairs, and if you look around, you can see how that gets translated into multiple different physical characteristics, behavioral characteristics, and uh, numerous others that I can't even, you know, think of at this moment. Uh, but yeah, so I think that's kind of where we're at right now. Yeah, thank you. And what is your specific research specialty? What are you interested yourself in? So my research is in the genetic determinants of intellectual disability, which used to be referred to as mental retardation before Rose's Law uh, went into effect. Um, we uh, primarily do clinical testing on uh, pediatric patients who have cognitive developmental delay, intellectual disability. Uh, we use chromosomal microarrays for that, and we're moving into doing the exome sequencing. Thank you very much. So that's Ben Darbro. And I think I'll go to you next, Tom. So you're an engineer. We heard in your introduction all these various parts of the university you're involved with. Um, what does an engineer have to do with genetics? So it's a great question. I get asked that question probably more than any. <laughs> uh, when people ask me what I do, I say, well, I'm an electrical engineering professor and I do research in genetics. And then people turn their head a bit and they wonder, you know, what they have to do with each other. Um, I'll have to confess that uh, in high school, uh, biology was a subject in science anyway that I liked the least um, because there was very little math involved. And uh, as things changed, as Ben was describing, um, in the uh, mid-1990s when the push to sequence the genome became um, you know, a, a primary objective of our science communities um, you know, worldwide, um, uh, some other of my colleagues here at Iowa came and, and knew that we would need, if we got our wish and got all the sequence data, uh, that we would need some computational capabilities uh, to deal with that. So the beginning of this was, in a, for me, it was in about 1994 when Ed Stone and Val Sheffield kind of approached me to, uh, to partner with them in some um, early projects in doing uh, high-throughput genotyping, which wasn't yet whole genome sequencing by any stretch, but it was trying to, as Ben was saying, look more closely and more precisely all the way. So that's where it started, and uh, there are many other ways that engineering training and engineers contribute to this field by simply knowing how to model complex systems mm -hmm. and um, think about how those systems uh, might be designed, even though we don't think of ourselves so much, you know, as being designed or, you know, if we do, that design process is, is not the same way that an engineer would approach things, I assure you. Mm -hmm. An engineer wouldn't send um, a, a spaceship uh, to a, a distant planet with the possibility of evolving on the way. Mm -hmm. um, that, that would be designed specifically to do exactly what it was going to do all the way there, and it wouldn't just randomly mutate and maybe get better or mm -hmm. die on the way. So there are some really big differences between the way that engineers are, are trained to do things, but they have some skills that are very valuable in this field. Mm -hmm. And so just with the two of you here, so, so Ben, if you're looking at this um, problem of um, cognitive development and uh, looking for a genetic source perhaps for it, so when you're looking at these chromosomes, you're looking into these um, uh, samples you have, you would be working with somebody like Tom to, to try to map out what the genes look like or compare one set of data with another and this is why the the high computing power makes a difference these let, days let me actually i want to give one small short analogy to to uh, kind of uh, um, 
maybe put it in perspective something that Ben said. Um, imagine that we downloaded all of a sudden um, a bunch of high resolution map data from a distant planet, right? And we were given the task of then labeling all of those images with the geographical features of interest, yet on that planet, let's say they didn't have rivers and mountains and cities and highways, they had other features that we'd never seen before. It's kind of where we were in 2003, and, and, and we're, that's the problem we're, we're really working on, is that we have this very detailed imagery of our genome at a very precise level, yet as Ben was saying, we don't have it labeled yet, so mm -hmm. that's a, you know, yeah. another way of thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and actually Tom and I work together very closely on several projects, and I think a, part of the reason why we need individuals with uh, Tom's skill set is the fact that you know, when I take a look at a lot of the uh, genome data, if you will, you think about it as 32 or, you know, 3.2 billion data points, it's sort of like um, drinking from a fire hose, you know, it's, a, it's, it's way too much, it's really information overload. Uh, so we, we've needed people to sort of build the, the informatic and sort of data analysis framework so that we can start to understand it, um, find differences between people with disease and those who don't, and ultimately start to interpret, you know, What's the difference between the normal variation that makes us all who we are and the variation in our genomes that actually causes disease? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Now, let me move to you, John. You, you teach in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. You're a biology professor and a researcher, and I know that you work on um, evolution and um, also the evolution of sex. We should talk about that. But um, tell us what your involvement is with genetics research. So I consider myself a molecular evolutionary geneticist. So that means that I'm an evolutionary biologist who's interested in the genetic underpinnings of the process um, at, at, at the molecular level. So uh, a lot of the things that are being discussed in terms of the human genome and the kind of data and analyses that, that are being discussed with regard, largely with regard to the human condition, are also applicable across all of biology. Um, and it's mutually informative. Um, you know, the human species is about four million years diverged from our common ancestor with chimps, so that's actually a very small amount of evolutionary history of life on Earth, 4.5 billion. Uh, it's an important four million, clearly. Uh, but uh, it turns out that, that by making comparisons to uh, all other kinds of biology at the genetic level, which we're now capable of doing uh, with these kind of technologies, um, we can not only learn more about biology uh, writ large, but, but um, perhaps inform uh, s some more um, specific questions, some applied questions with regard to human health. And I'll just, uh, I just came from a seminar over in biology, had, had to skip out a little bit at the end, but um, it's, it's relevant to this discussion. Um, our, our speaker was talking about meiosis, which is the process of cell division that creates haploid cells. That's the process that I happen to work on as well. Mm -hmm. And um, it turns out that she's working on it in a, in a genetic model system called uh, C. elegans, C. neurodides elegans, um, a nematode worm. Now, now, these organisms are about a half a billion years separated from us, okay? So 500 million years or so. Um, but her work is funded by the National Institutes of Health. And, and the reason why is because comparisons at the genetic level can be made in, and experiments can be done in these organisms that can inform about human health. And, and um, so one of the things that, she, that her, uh, it's, it's um, Dr. Coliacavio uh, at Harvard was talking about, um, uh, the, the process by which chromosomes non-disjoin, and that's the process by which many birth defects in humans are are generated, and it turns out she has a model system in these worms that informs, from an evolutionary point of view, mm -hmm. the process in humans, and then she was finishing up, um, when I left, talking about this phenol, um, this, this chemical that's in our environment, and using the worm to understand the toxicology of that and the genetic consequences of that to meiotic cell division and non-disjunction in these chromosomes that lead to things like um, trisomy, et cetera, that are um, serious causes of birth defects in humans. So um, though I don't specifically work on these questions of direct mm -hmm. relevance to human health, but, but evolution informs those questions, mm -hmm. and those questions inform evolution, and, and that's sort of the intersection yeah. where genetics um, has a broad base in, uh, in this technology, and it's, it's being applied across the board. 
Yeah. Well, I know in the biology department you have undergraduate students, and you have a, a great opportunity there to get your graduate students and your undergraduate students into labs and really doing serious work with genetics, don't you? Right. So, um, so the Department of Biology and other departments across campus um, have a large um, bevy of, of undergraduate students that are often um, doing a lot of the hard work of genetics yeah. that goes on in our labs. So we honors programs, et cetera. We, you mentioned at the top of the show that, that there's an interdisciplinary genetics mm -hmm. program on campus of which I'm a member and Tom's a member. Are you a member? You should. <laughs> okay, uh, and 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 we don't have a genetics department per se, but we all we're all in different mm -hmm. departments, and we we sort of come together in this genetics uh, framework, yeah. and it's and we have uh, PhD students and and other activities around that, and so mm -hmm. um, that interdisciplinary nature of what genetics is um, is is part of the strength of of genetics. Right, right. right. Well, I think that um, learning a little bit about all of this is important to us at, at any stage in our understanding of what genetics w are all about. But, you know, the most basic question I think most people ask is, you know, why does this matter to me? Why should anybody be studying a worm from however many years ago you said, I mean, how could that possibly mean anything in my life? And I think sometimes uh, discussing this with a public that maybe doesn't think about genetics until they find that they have a grandchild born with a problem and they suddenly have to learn what that really means or someone develops cancer and then you're flooded with information that you know you really don't understand um, it's kind of a hard topic to just kind of put in a, in a little um, one paragraph description and have we, people really know what you're talking about I mean humans are hard experimental models I mean yeah. um, and yeah. For, for lots of good reasons. And, and so these, these model organisms, including things like fruit flies, um, yeah. genetics was essentially founded in, in these little organisms, fruit flies that annoy us during the summer. Right, um, but, right. but they've been very important in, in providing us the rules for how things work um, that have led to the Human Genome Project, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, basic research really is at the core of, of genetics and, and these, these, uh, these applied aspects, the ability to do a $5,000 human genome would never have happened had it not been for all this basic research that, um, yeah. that is just sort of taken for granted sometimes. Yeah. Well, when I ask that question about why does it matter to me, do you guys have any response to that? Well, one thing that I might uh, add to that uh, question is um, a couple years back, uh, when we started to find this variation in the human genome amongst all of us, we referred to them as uh, polymorphisms. Uh, and if it was only a one base pair or a one A, T, C, or G difference, we called it a single nucleotide polymorphism or a SNP. Well, we started realizing that this variation was very common amongst human beings, and we, we came up with this hypothesis that maybe this common variation was responsible for a lot of the common disease that we have, things like diabetes, hypertension. Um, age-related macular degeneration, things like that. So we started to do something called genome-wide association studies, or GWAS. And uh, the results actually were a little bit disappointing, in a sense. Um, we did learn a lot about the biology of these complex disorders, but ultimately we found that these SNPs account for very little of the actual genetic effect of these disorders. So whereas I think that for an everyday average person who may be healthy, um, we could interrogate your entire genome, and we could actually say things like, well, because of these genetic variations, you have an increased risk of developing diabetes. But the thing to keep in mind, though, is that because the genetic effect of these variants is very small, that might be a difference between a 54% chance and a 56% chance of developing diabetes. So having an increased risk doesn't necessarily tell you how much of an increased risk. Mm -hmm. On that one is that a lot of those kind of analyses were, are embedded in an evolutionary perspective and linkage and 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 mutations sort of um, um, being co-inherited, et cetera. So so again, basic research led to these kind of testing um, and and which have been quite common in, in human uh, genetic diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Um, let me ask you a question, Tom, and maybe everybody has a response to this. Regarding to genetics, uh, regarding genetics and new technologies, what's your greatest fear? So my greatest fear is kind of divided between um, what people might know and what they might not know, and whether that's you know correct or not. And I think it's uh, I, I, my biggest struggle sometimes is um, encountering someone who has a misconception about what genetics might tell us. For example, about race. Um, I also you know fear that um, people will um, think that there's there's harm that can come from 
um, knowing too much. And uh, I guess a program like this one, I think, is a, a great opportunity to try to, to, to just give information which is correct and that is in, in a context you know, where, um, where scientists are trying to integrate the ethical issues as well as the value to society and kind of integrating across those. And I think that sometimes um, the public has the impression that in academia we don't worry about those things, that we don't consider those things, and that's definitely not the case. Um, it's just that we're quite often so focused on the very specific scientific problems that we're working on that we don't have a chance to really talk mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Do you have any fear related to this, Ben? Um, a fear? I think as a clinical cytogeneticist, my, my greatest fear is uh, misinterpretation. Uh, I think that we, uh, as scientists, are very enthusiastic about the work that we do, and uh, I'm very enthusiastic about the, the advance in technology. And um, I think the, my very greatest concern is that I overinterpret some things because there is so much normal variation in the human genome, just finding a difference in somebody doesn't necessarily mean it's pathogenic or a disease-causing variation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What about you, John? Uh, the, I mean, I, I'm not directly involved in uh, clinical aspects, but, but I've got a, a little story to tell about the, a, a company that I won't mention, but we can get our you know, DNA analyzed, all of us, by sending some in. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of people have had it done, and I had a friend that had it done. And uh, he shared his results with me, and it, uh, and and the thing that he told me based on these data was that, wow, he has two X chromosomes. Boys have X and Y, um, so he he would have had two X's and a Y given those given that that genetic outcome. And and I he says you know, uh, I, I've done some work on Google, and and it looks and it looks like there's there's uh, some possibility that you could you could not have you could asymptomatic uh, syndrome that would have these and I looked at it and I said it's a mistake it's got to be a mistake and it turns out that it that it was and so mm -hmm. um, it, it has something to do with yeah. it has yeah. something to do with the technology and yeah. and it gets to this question of of it's great to have a glimpse of your genome and um, you know to have and own that but but mm -hmm. I you know I think he was kind of interested in it in his mm -hmm. case, but, but in another person, it might have created a whole bunch of stress, and, and that yeah. other person might not have solved it the way that yeah. he, he did eventually. Yeah. And so yeah. uh, I, I think we have to be a little bit careful in that regard because the public is not, and this is a highly educated person, and the public isn't, isn't terribly able to digest this kind of information sometimes. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, boy, thank you for starting us off so well, John Logston, Benjamin Darbro, and Tom Casvan. Thank you. We'll have you up a little bit later. Please say thank you to our guests. <laughs> this is World Canvas, and I'm Joan Kerr. Thank you for joining us for this program on genetics and new technologies. If you'd like to see or hear this program again, multiple viewing and listening opportunities are available, and you can find them all at our website, which is international.uiowa.edu slash World Canvas. I'd now like to introduce our next guest, um, just getting settled now. Uh, Dan Reed is the UI Vice President for Research and Economic Development. He was Corporate Vice President at Microsoft from 2009 to 2012, responsible for global technology policy and extreme computing, and has served on the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology and on the President's Information Technology Advisory Committee, appointed by President Bush. We're happy to have you with us, Vice President Reed. Thank you very much. My pleasure much. to be here. And you've been here since? Since October? Since October. Yeah, well, great to have you here on this program with us. And um, I know that you can talk quite specifically about genetics because you've been involved in that. You wrote a wonderful piece that was in the paper earlier in the week. Um, but I also wanted to get a picture of the, the research picture here on campus, generally speaking. Where are we and where do we want to go as the University of Iowa? Well, I think one of the things to, to bear in mind as we sort of look at the perspective that was offered at the outset is the sequencing of the human genome and really the possibilities that it has for medical care and the effects on our lives are a consequence of the increasingly multidisciplinary interplay across different areas of research and the translation. In fact, the sequencing of the human genome wouldn't have been possible without collaborations among geneticists and biologists, biochemists, people in material science, and as was mentioned, computing. In fact, one of the ways the first genome was sequenced was a technique that the term of arts calls shotgun sequencing. And if you want an analogy, think of taking your newspaper, running it through a shredder, uh, and then reassembling it in order mm -hmm. to interpret what happened. 
and the computing part was the reassembly, uh, the technology that broke the initial sequence down into pieces to put it together. But it's a great example of the interplay of technologies. And as we look forward, more and more of that's happening. But at a high level, what I would say is true at Iowa as, as well as globally, are really two or three themes. One is the increasingly multidisciplinary nature of interaction, bringing expertise together across groups to develop new insights. The second one is the faster, faster, faster nature. Knowledge is exploding. It's doubling at a rate that's truly phenomenal. We learn more now in a, in a few months than we used to learn in centuries. And one of our challenges then is how do we translate that into practice? In some sense, perhaps the only thing worse than not knowing something is being overrun by information and understanding how to interpret it. And I guess the last piece I would say uh, that's a consequence of all of this is the increasingly global interdependence. Research is a global enterprise, but equally importantly, the manifestations of research are global. They're global in terms of our societal effects, and they're global in terms of the economic effects and how we translate that into better quality of life, what it means for jobs, and, and the, the health and well-being of citizens in the state of Iowa. Yeah, that was actually the next point I was going to get to. Um, you were quoted in a piece, I think, in the Quarter Business Journal about uh, the need for the university to sort of reinvent itself in terms of partnerships that, that produce uh, economic development in the state and so on. Elaborate on that, if you would. What do you see happening there? Well, I think one of the things to bear in mind about research universities, uh, if you think back about the history uh, of universities in the U.S., it's been one of increasing democratization of access. It's brought more and more people. Uh, and we really live in a knowledge economy. And so that speaks to how do we translate uh, new ideas from the university into practical advantage in people's lives. In the case of genetics and medicine, of course, it's better health, lower cost health care. But more generally, it's about how do we allow individuals to be competitive because the truth is now, even if you're a small business person in Iowa, your competitors are not the people down the street or even the people over in Chicago. They're the entire planet. You know, you're competing with someone who may be in Shanghai or New Delhi to be economically successful. So part of the challenge for the university is how do we establish more robust and, and more effective partnerships with the citizens? And that means taking new ideas into practical ways that uh, our students can be entrepreneurial, uh, that they can start new companies, because most jobs actually grow out of small companies. So how we educate students to be successful is a piece. But the other is how we work directly with Iowa companies and other entities in the state to give them early advantage. Because in a knowledge economy, success really accrues to those who can capitalize on ideas first. In the business world, there's this concept of first mover, and it means who gets there first because you established mind share. And once you establish mind share, there's a huge snowball effect that begins because of that. If you're late to get there, it's very hard to get over that hill to catch up. And so a lot of what I think is incumbent upon us in the university is to be a partner. Uh, and as we think about that future, it's also important to realize that the history of universities, they have evolved over and over and over again from the early days in the founding of the country when universities were largely about educating clergy. Uh, if you think about what happened after the Second World War with the GI Bill, huge democratization. Uh, our parents were beneficiaries of that. The growth of modern science in the U.S. that happened in the 50s and 60s, uh, what happened with the Civil Rights Act, with Title IX, it's all been about broadening access and bringing more people together. And the last thing I would say to remember Smart and well-educated people are always in short supply. And what it means for Iowa is that we better educate and better position our citizens to compete in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us a little bit about how um, your various science faculty, medical faculty, just as an example, go about getting grants from the NIH, I think was mentioned a little bit earlier, certainly many granting um, sources. How important is this to the university's research effort, and um, um, what support do we give our scientists as they make those applications? So the majority of research that takes place in the university is supported by the federal government, as I mentioned, and that's uh, several hundred million dollars a year. That has direct effects on the Iowa economy in terms of, of employment for researchers, for faculty, for students. 
So there's that direct effect. There is the indirect effect that occurs from, as I said, the knowledge creation and the way that faculty and students start companies, the way that we license technologies to other companies. But in terms of the research enterprise, it is an increasingly global and competitive enterprise as well. But what faculty do uh, in order to pursue new ideas is they prepare proposals and there are a variety of federal agencies that support that, the National Institutes of Health being the major one in genetics, but the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, NASA, the Department of Defense. Those proposals get reviewed by uh, our competitors. Uh, the other researchers uh, around the country, and they get ranked based on the quality and the strength of the ideas. The whole idea is that the best ideas get funded and that those uh, ideas get explored. So what is important for the institution is that we position our faculty and our researchers, just as I was saying in the economic sense, to be more competitive. And that means the institution has to arm them with capabilities, whether it be instrumentation, uh, physical plant, the new buildings that you've seen being built on campus are all part of enabling that. And building the right partnerships so that when our faculty go to propose new ideas, they're better positioned than, than the others. And I do want to add one other point. We've been talking about science and technology and a bit about business. Uh, and you touched on this in the previous segment. It's really critical to realize the importance of the arts and the humanities in terms of thinking about these issues. Because one of the big challenges that we have with the rapid advance of science and technology is that it's outstripping the ability of many of our historical social cultures to think about change. You think about our parents' generation, what they learned at 18 largely served them for a lifetime. Now an entire economic sector can be destroyed in a handful of years. More importantly, these deep questions about what technology means for healthcare and how we make choices really means that we have to illuminate the science and technology with an understanding of the human condition. And that's what the arts and humanities and history are really about, understanding that interplay. And it's another great example of that multidisciplinary lifeblood that a great research university brings to complex problems. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I, many in the audience will know that there was a, uh, an effort, maybe it's still an ongoing effort, to create a, a, genetic, a genetics cluster, hiring uh, a number of faculty in various departments across the university that might all work together to sort of amplify the research in a given area. Um, are there arts and humanities people connected with that? There are. There are, there are a wide variety of people across the, the arts and humanities and law and other disciplines involved in these issues because uh, another one of those terms of art that you may sometimes see is, is ELSI. It's the ethical and legal issues around genetics. Uh, and that's exactly where those people come from. Um, they bring a perspective from society that complements the basic and pure research questions. So one more thing I might ask you to comment on before we have to break. Uh, is the national discussion we hear periodically, it's certainly going on right now, um, about limited funding nationally and perhaps funding being cut back for scientific research and so on. Um, how much does a university as an enterprise worry about that when it looks as though there may be significant funding cuts to those um, resources? Oh, it absolutely matters. And, and just as you think about this compact with society, uh, the federal enterprise writ large we know is under great financial stress. That's what all the strum and drank, drang and, and DC is about, is how we deal with those issues. I sometimes describe the federal budget as uh, uh, a lot of social services with a police force and some hobbies. Uh, and in terms of the dollar distribution, that's a, that's a pretty accurate way to think about it. Everything that we think about research and innovation is in the hobby category. Uh, it's so-called discretionary spending, uh, and it's under a lot of pressure as well. Uh, if we see uh, uh, declines in that budget, uh, yes, it has implications for the university. Mm -hmm. It's why all of the things I said earlier about positioning us to be differentially successful relative to our peers is really important because it's a finite sum game. Uh, and it's important that uh, we be competitive relative to everyone else. But yes, it's a topic mm -hmm. of conversation, just as, as the other aspects mm -hmm. are. Uh, one of the things that I will say in passing, having been on lots of national advisory committees, 
Uh, one uh, uh, member of, of uh, uh, agencies in D.C. once said to me, this may not come as a surprise to you, but it's rare for people to come to Washington and say, I'm dumb and I have too much money. Can you fix my problem? <laughs> there are more good ideas to go around than there is money. And so what we have to do is make sure that our good ideas are cast in the best light and they have the best resources behind them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know you worked in universities before you were involved with Microsoft and you were with Microsoft for many years. So you've, you've been involved with this very, um, um, important strategic level with the development of the internet and software and whatnot. How does being back here at, in, in a university environment, managing research and, and um, economic development compare? Are, are there similarities in those two positions or are they all altogether different? Oh, it's a great question because people ask me the opposite when I went to industry is how different is it than being in academia? And there are differences for sure. Uh, some things are more challenging in industry than they are in academia, and there's some things that are uh, you know, more difficult to achieve in an academic environment just by the nature of organizations. But there were more similarities than there are differences. Uh, there were lots of very talented people working hard to bring their ideas to life. Uh, that's the, the common theme. Uh, I think one of the things that, that is a fundamental difference between universities and, and and business, one is the breadth of interests that are in academia, and that's really what brought me back. We've talked about the arts and humanities and science and technology and economic development. It's a smorgasbord of intellectual delight, and that's, that's really the, the absolutely exciting thing that brought me back to the university. The flip side is we live in a world where in some sense ideas are our coin of the realm, uh, and there are lots of them, but to your point about uh, research, research budgets and other things, we are more resource challenged. Uh, and so we, we have lots of ideas. We sometimes struggle to capitalize them. Uh, successful companies tend to have the opposite. Uh, uh, capital is relatively widely available, uh, but ideas are really precious there <laughs> because uh, you have very severe metrics of success. You make money, you, you succeed. You don't make money, you die. So there's a very simple <laughs> metric of success. We have a much more diverse metric of success, and that's part of the joy. Yeah. Well, pleasure to have you here. Thank you very My much, pleasure. Dan Reed. Please say thanks to our guests. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, joining us now are two friends and colleagues who worked together for a long time here on the campus of the University of Iowa. Uh, sitting uh, on the end there is Val Sheffield, a professor of pediatrics and genetics, and also the director of the UI Division of Medical Genetics. And uh, Val Sheffield and his colleague Ed Stone are Howard Hughes investigators studying the genetics of human disease. And thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Your pleasure. And you know Tom Casavant from our earlier segment. So I'd like to talk to you both about your individual specializations and the research you, you do together, how the, the collaboration between your work areas really works. And give us an idea of what research is actually physically like between people from sort of very different disciplines, but disciplines that need each other or at least enjoy each other. Um, so Val, I guess you study the genetics of human disease, and, and I'll ask you to tell us really that sounds like everything, right? Uh, tell us a little more about what that means. Okay. Uh, well, I'm also a clinical geneticist, so I see patients. And all my uh, research begins with, with a human patient. And uh, so we might see someone in the clinic with a specific disease. In fact, uh, that happened some 20 years ago, and I saw an interesting patient with blindness. It got me interested in blindness. I began collaborating with the ophthalmology department, specifically with Ed Stone and Lee Allward. And uh, we started working on the genetics of uh, blinding disorders. And what we found was that uh, as we gathered more and more information, uh, the management of the information became limiting. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we needed help. Uh, literally back at that time, I would write down the information on uh, paper towels, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and it just got to be uh, that we needed much more uh, sophisticated handling of the data, mm -hmm. and we approached Tom uh, Cassavant to help with that. Yeah. So Tom, had you worked with, with this kind of research before, or was this the first time you got into genetics uh, research? Not even remotely. Um, 
1993 and four, I spent a sabbatical in, uh, in Switzerland. And uh, I was working in, in my area, which at the time was high performance computing. Uh, my background was purely in mathematics, computer science, and electrical engineering. And in fact, I had so little interest in, in the life sciences and biology that every day when I would go to coffee um, and we would sit across the table with these guys who were doing something called protein folding, I, com I just tuned it out. And after a longer exposure to these guys, um, I started to realize that this was, these were the people who were using the supercomputers that I was working on building, and it caught a little bit of my interest. When I came back from that sabbatical, um, I met Ed and, and Val. Um, they were kind of in a, they had a very specific thing that they wanted help with, and I remember very vividly sitting down on a Thursday afternoon with, uh, with Ed Stone, uh, thinking that I was going to just help him with this little problem, and we sat there for something like four hours. And for those who know Ed Stone, that's not hard to imagine, but uh, it, was, it was the beginning of a, of a really a very expansive collaboration um, that began with a very specific problem. And as, as Val was saying, um, there was the foresight um, that, that if they got their wish, and they wouldn't be able to keep this on paper, they would have stacks of paper, they'd be literally buried in the paper, not to mention the fact that they wouldn't be able to sort through it all. Mm -hmm. So without really having the knowledge of exactly how that would be done, um, that's the nature of, of interdisciplinary collaboration, to reach out to someone who does have that expertise and then educate each other um, along the way. And, and I've been really uh, very uh, blessed to, to work with people who have been so willing to educate such an ignorant fool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one thing I wanted to comment on was uh, Tom mentioned before that uh, uh, he wasn't interested in biology because there was uh, too much math. I went into biology because there wasn't math. <laughs> and <coughs> and uh, so this collaboration has really uh, worked because we, we meet needs. But one of the interesting things early on is that it probably took us two years to learn how to talk to each other. Yeah. We spoke different languages. Mm -hmm. And it was easier for Tom to learn the language of genetics than it was me, for <laughs> me to mm -hmm. learn the language of uh, yeah. bioinformatics. Yeah. I, don't, I, agree with that. I, th I think Val has learned a lot. Well, now, um, so it started with one patient, but then over time, you've you've gotten very, very involved with the study of genetics as, as related to diseases. Other diseases beside, yeah. or, or impairments beside blindness? Yeah, well, uh, my lab works on some uh, 30 different uh, diseases where we've discovered the, the gene that, that causes a spe specific disease. And uh, uh, I think we're one of the top maybe five labs in the world uh, yeah. uh, in doing that. And, it's because we have great people and uh, mm -hmm. great bioinformatics and uh, collaborations, mm -hmm. what makes things go well. But another thing that makes things go well here in Iowa is that the patients are, are very willing to participate in studies. Huh. And uh, uh, I've had several uh, pretty significant breakthroughs that have occurred because of uh, a single patient being willing to uh, uh, be a research subject. Mm -hmm. Of course, mm -hmm. we, we take care of all the uh, informed consent things yeah, in the appropriate sure. way, but uh, sure. uh, uh, the patient's uh, contributions mm -hmm. to research are, are uh, pretty outstanding. Mm -hmm. And we take a lot of the human diseases we study, and then we take them to animal models and uh, uh, that allows us to do experiments that we couldn't do in people yeah. with the hopes of then bringing treatment uh, back to the patients. And we're just starting to get to that point now. Yeah, you know, this is, has always been mystifying to me that you, c you can work with mice or whatever and you discover something that, you know, leads you to a cure or, or, a, or a, a treatment yeah. for, for a disease. I, I don't understand how that happens. Yeah, well... It's not only just with animals, but uh, it's sort of with people, too, because uh, many of the disorders we study are very rare. You might see a one in a hundred thousand uh, disease. And why would someone study a one in a hundred thousand 
uh, disease if, you know, if you're only going to help one in 100,000 people. But that's not the way it works uh, because often you learn uh, some basic principle from a rare uh, exception to the rule that allows you to apply something uh, to a much larger population. Mm -hmm. For example, one of the disorders we study, which is about a one in 100,000 uh, disease, uh, causes uh, not only blindness, but obesity and high blood pressure and diabetes. Mm -hmm. and, and we're getting insight into uh, the obesity and the diabetes through the study mm -hmm. of a very rare disorder. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll say that early on, it was exactly this kind of narrative which really hooked me. Um, because as an engineer, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, so what is it that connects those things together? What's the, what's the mechanism underlying that? And it came as quite a shock to me to discover how most drugs and uh, therapies were developed um, you know, up until this point. It was so much trial and error. And even when a drug worked quite often, it wasn't completely understood exactly why. And I can tell you that engineers don't design things that they don't know why they work. Um, we know why airplanes stay in the air, and we know, you know all, of those, all of those things before we put people in them, for example. So to me, it was, it was a bit of a shock that medicine was, medical research was really kind of being done the way it was. So one of my grand um, dreams in being involved in this was to bring more of a methodical design-oriented approach to, to doing medicine, to understanding disease and, and understanding how it works and therefore having a therapy or a treatment that we could design uh, which we would actually be able to predict outcome. Uh, one of the grand challenges of, of bioinformatics, um, computational challenges, is to develop a computer simulation of the cells in our body and then larger models that incorporate multiple cells and organ systems and so on. And we're quite a ways from being able to really do that. But that goal, I think, is just, well, for me, it's one of the, the attractions to this field. Um, I'll die before we solve all those problems, but um, I hope to contribute to being able to, um, to do that because that's exactly how we build new aircraft or how we, you know, how we design uh, any kind of new system in engineering is that we know the environment, we have a model for it, and we're able to predict ahead of time what the effects will be. Right. Well, can I get you to talk a little bit about pediatric screenings, too, and what you discover there? Uh, all states have a newborn screening program, and uh, I'm the director of the newborn screening uh, program, or the medical director of the newborn screening program here in Iowa. And uh, we screen newborns for some uh, 50 different disorders. It used to only be seven and then nine. And now as technology uh, comes into play, we screen uh, for many more uh, disorders. And this number will just keep in, uh, increasing uh, based on uh, the new technologies of uh, sequencing and things as those come into play. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, we screen based on given principles. We screen for disorders that we can do something about. Mm -hmm and that aren't readily uh, apparent without a screening test. Mm -hmm. uh, because with any test, particularly a screening test, you can have uh, false positives, and yeah. so people would be worried unnecessarily uh, if, uh, um, you know, they we were told their child had something, then they didn't end up mm -hmm. having that. Uh, but we have good screening tests. We're able to pick up uh, babies. The most common one that people have heard of the most is phenylketonuria, or PKU. Uh, it used to be those children would uh, grow up and be uh, mentally retarded. Uh, now, with treatment, uh, which is just a specialized diet, they grow up uh, normal intellectually and they do great. And so we want to pick up those types of findings in, in uh, newborns so that they can be uh, treated uh, on a prophylactic basis. Yeah, but you say you screen for those things you can treat. Um, are, are there, are there uh, treatments are variably successful, I guess, right? So yeah. sometimes there mm -hmm. are still really hard choices for parents, for doctors. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, some of the disorders that are, 
are starting to be screened for are, uh, are, are less uh, successfully treated or require m much more intense uh, treatment. One that we're bringing on board uh, soon is something called SCID for Severe Combined Immune Deficiency. Uh, we're going to start screening for that in, in Iowa uh, beginning uh, in the next month. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that will require a bone marrow transplant in those babies. But the data show that babies that receive the bone marrow transplant early on do better than those that receive it later. Mm -hmm. So you want to diagnose it in the newborn period. Mm -hmm. And that's why a screening test will be done. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sure parents are all informed, even before the baby is born, that this will be done, I guess, right after the baby is born, while they're in the hospital? Yes, uh, parents are uh, informed uh, that their child will be screened. It's a, mm -hmm. a heel stick to mm -hmm. get a little drop of blood, uh, mm -hmm. or several little drops of blood that are put on a piece of filter paper sent to a central lab. Mm -hmm. And uh, the tests are done. And yeah. uh, most people don't give it a second thought because most of them are normal. Mm -hmm. But the ones that come back, uh, uh, those parents uh, end up being enormously grateful. Sure. And, uh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, did I hear that you have done work in the Negev? Or you've done work with the Bedouins? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, initially, when we started our work on hereditary blindness, uh, we used mostly patients from Iowa. And uh, then I became interested in a different uh, mode of inheritance, autosomal recessive inheritance, whereas most of the ones that we were working on in Iowa, at least initially, were dominantly inherited. And, and it mattered because uh, uh, if you uh, study recessive uh, inheritance diseases, uh, you want to go to a population where there's lots of inbreeding, where people marry their cousins mm -hmm. or nieces and uh, nephews, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, that happens in the Bedouin population in, in uh, the Negev uh, region of uh, southern Israel. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started a collaboration with some wonderful uh, people there. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, Israeli physician and a Bedouin Arab physician were collaborators and we went there and uh, started working on some very interesting diseases mm -hmm. uh, there. We've tried to take the information we've learned then back to those Bedouin populations so that they can benefit uh, from, mm -hmm. from the research. Yeah. Again, we did the, all this with the appropriate informed consent sure. and following all the rules sure, to absolutely. the letter. Um, this may, I don't know if this is an area you really want to talk about right now, but I know the one thing that is periodically very much in the news is stem, stem cell research. And there is research going on in some countries, you know, right now, uh, stem cell research can't go on in the United States or in very limited ways. Mm -hmm. I, I think you could clarify what they can do yeah. and can't do, but. Yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, the Nobel Prize was just given for something called. Uh, uh, inducible pluripotent stem cells. And that's where you can take uh, cells from, say, a skin biopsy of a person, and you can, by genetic manipulating that cell, you can turn it into a cell line that uh, is like a stem cell. And that allows uh, 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 to bypass a lot of the uh, ethical yeah. issues. And uh, that type of research, for example, is being done here at the University of Iowa. We're in doing it in collaboration with uh, Ed Stone and uh, Bud Tucker, mm -hmm. who's a new, relatively new assistant professor here who mm -hmm. came from Harvard. Mm -hmm. And we recruited him basically to help do uh, stem cell research for uh, treatment of hereditary blindness. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I would 
I would say that this um, induced pluripotent stem cell technology is a, is a great example of how the way that engineers, you know, have thought historically crosses over into medicine. Um, the, idea, the problematic, um, you know, notion that, that we want these stem cells that are undifferentiated, um, yet there seem to be, you know, a lot of ethical concerns with, with how to obtain those. Well, um, the idea just seemed a completely natural one to me, that if we knew the process by which the cells differentiated into the different types of cells in our bodies, mm -hmm. that we might be able to debug that yeah. program yeah. and uh, think about how to possibly um, reverse the process. Now, those who know about software know that it's not easy to reverse a program. You can't just run it backwards like the odometer in a car. <laughs> but the idea is the same. And uh, what Val was referring to is um, a set of genes that we can selectively um, induce their expression and then cause the, the cell to go back to a state that is, as Val said, very similar to um, that nascent uh, stem cell state. Yeah. And so uh, one thing uh, Dan Reed was talking about was the, uh, your competition may not be the guy or the woman down the street, but clearly anybody anywhere in the world who's working on the same kinds of things you are has the same product you, you uh, create. Is it important to have international scientific collaboration? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think it's very interesting that I uh, collaborate with an Israeli physician and a Bedouin Arab and uh, they get along great together. <laughs> and science, I find, brings people together. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, you know, I don't worry too much about competition because, uh, first of all, uh, we can write good grants and do well. Uh, but second of all, uh, uh, if people find something that we're working on, there's always something uh, more to do yeah. to, uh, to build upon that, mm -hmm. and all of it is for the benefit of uh, the patients and individuals. Yeah. Yeah. I, think as, I think as Dan, what Dan Reed was saying, you know, that we're idea rich, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that that's one of the uh, one of the reasons that I've you know chosen a career in academia and have been really so very happy is that um, there is a great deal of, of freedom to follow that curiosity, and, mm -hmm. and quite often when. Um, graduate students will talk to me about a career in, in research, the number one question I ask them is, are you curious? How curious are you? Because your curiosity is probably the most valuable asset, and I think that spans all academic disciplines, not just mm -hmm. the sciences and engineering. Yeah. Before I let you go, Val, is, is there anything that scares you about what we know and, and what we want to do with that knowledge? Well, uh, the thing that I'm afraid of is that people will be fearful. Uh, so a lot of people, I think, will overlook the good because they'll focus on those aspects that might be a little scary. Mm -hmm. So I'm worried about that. I'm also worried about uh, physicians uh, looking too much at the uh, immense amount of data rather than looking at the patient. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of uh, information in just talking to the patient mm -hmm. uh, as much or more than uh, looking at their genome data. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Thank you so much. I'm going to keep you, Tom. Thank you, Val, for joining us. I appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs> This is World Canvas from International Programs at the University of Iowa. I'm Joan Kerr, and we invite you to join us as a member of our live audience for our next program, which will be on March 8th. The topic then will be the book culture, languages, and arts of indigenous peoples. And that program will take place in this room, Senate Chamber of the Old Capitol Museum. All of our programs are broadcast on UITV and KRUI-FM. They can be accessed anywhere in the world through iTunes and the Public Radio Exchange. So now we welcome another guest, George Wiener. Good to have you here. Thanks very much. Glad to be here. Uh, George Wiener is the director of the Holden Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, he's also a professor of internal medicine here at the university. And we're going to turn now to a subject that many of us have too close an association with uh, cancer. Uh, the Holden Comprehensive Cancer Center, uh, you've all heard the name perhaps uh, visited it really impressive institution and you have the responsibility of directing um, the Cancer Center and Tom, I've asked you to stay with us through this segment as well because I know that you work very closely as 
What are you there? You're the Associate Director of Bioinformatics at the Holden Comprehensive Cancer Center. So, um, where do we start to talk about, about cancer? Uh, you know, probably one of the most feared diagnoses anyone can get and one that keeps turning up more sure. and more. Well, I think we can start by saying everything we know about cancer genetics that's leading to great advances actually comes from the work of basic scientists you heard about. Mm -hmm. And I, I can give some examples. Yeah. Um, fruit fly geneticists noticed that there were genes that went haywire and made the fruit flies look funny. <laughs> and very creative in naming these, they named one of the genes frizzled and another <laughs> one sonic hedgehog. Okay? <laughs> these are just based on what these flies look like under the microscope. Well, lo and behold, 10 years later, when we start looking at similar genes in cancer patients, we saw that those genes were mutated hmm. and that some of those mutations actually were responsible for the cancer and now are targets for new cancer therapies. Now, it's, you can't really tell a patient you've got a mutation in your sonic hedgehog, so we <laughs> give them different names. Mm -hmm. But um, really, it, it, the basic research is the foundation of everything that we know. Yeah. I also should mention that when we talk about cancer genetics, we really talk about it at two different levels. Mm -hmm. um, most of the genetics we've been talking about is the genetics of every cell in your body that you inherited from your mother and your father. And in, <coughs> excuse me. And in fact, we know from experience that there are certain genes that you do inherit that can change your risk of cancer. So mm -hmm. that's one type of cancer genetics that we use extensively, particularly for breast cancer, mm -hmm. to, to assess someone's risk. We also know that cells can go haywire in the body and that when that happens, cancer can occur. Hmm. And in those cases, we have to compare the normal genetics of the normal cells to the genetics in the cancer cell. And that is a very complex comparison that needs to take place. And that's one of the areas where we have to rely on uh, Tom and his colleagues hmm. to help us look through you know, the, the, the billions of base pairs hmm. in the normal cells of the patient and in the cancer of the patient and try to figure out which ones are important. Mm -hmm. So a, a patient presents herself to you, and uh, uh, maybe through surgery or something, it's discovered, oh, this person has cancer, but it's a brand new patient to you. How do you begin to diagnose what's wrong? What do you, what do you look for? What do you look through? Well, you know, as, as Ed mentioned, first we talk to the patient, mm -hmm. and obviously we get a lot of information from that. We look at the x-rays at the large scale, we look at the cells under the microscope at a smaller scale. Mm -hmm. And then very often we actually look at the genes at an even smaller scale. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we've learned just in the past few years, that the two patients can look the same, their x-rays can look the same, their cells can look the same, but the genetics that's causing their cancer might be very different. And mm -hmm. we're just on the cusp now of being able to look at that genetics and personalize a precise therapy for each patient based on their cancer genetics. Now, we're, we're just at the beginning of this, mm -hmm. and one of the things we're learning is that cancer is incredibly complicated. Um, we used to treat most uh, lung cancers the same with a certain type of chemotherapy. Well, we now know that about 6% of those lung cancers have a particular mutation that actually responds to a pill that targets that mutation. Four other percent respond to a different pill. So we're going to end up with hundreds of different treatments for patients based on the genetics of their particular cancer and their particular genetic makeup. Hmm. So although it's incredibly complicated, you feel positively inclined toward the future. I mean, you think with time and with enough investigation, we really will be able to get in there and tackle just about every cancer that, yeah. I'll say, with respect to the complexity, um, this was one of the things that definitely attracted me to this field early on, is that, you know, I was used to dealing with large complex systems and modeling them and analyzing them and, and building them. So that was actually something I looked forward to, was actually working with these complex things. And Ben, in the opening, said, mentioned these SNPs, or these single nucleotide polymorphisms, and I think there was a hope for a long time, although it might not have been stated as hope, that most diseases or most presentations of disease, there would be a corresponding SNP and there would be a small change. And then that small change would tell you what's wrong and you would be able to predict all the outcome. And as George was saying, the complexity is such that, first of all, that's not true. It didn't turn out to be anywhere near that uh, simple. And that there are many other ways that our genomes vary. And as George was saying, in, in cancer cells themselves, once they've become malignant and are growing you know, out of control, 
it's as if you know, a, um, you know, a food processor had its way with the genome in those cells and it's rearranged. And sometimes the rearrangements are, are, are extreme. They're, and it's very difficult to even group the different uh, types of cells according to what their genomes look like. And one of the largest uh, uh, NIH-funded uh, genome sequencing projects today is a cancer genome atlas project where they're taking many different types of tumors and resequencing them using this technology that, uh, that has been talked about here that's, uh, the cost is so much lower. But the informatics problem, the computational problem of then taking that data and trying to line it up, um, it's really difficult because uh, as um, in, the, in the opening segment uh, when John Logsdon was talking about the variations between us, well, the variation between us and a mouse is probably on the order of about, what, 5 percent, something like that. Um, the variation between two cancers, a cancer cell and a normal cell in the same person can go far beyond this 5 percent. So even the tools that were developed, the computational tools that were developed to do comparative genomics uh, between different species are not up to the task of looking at some of these problems in cancer. So as George said, there's the, the normal cells in your body and how we vary and their predisposition that comes from that, but then looking at the cancer cells themselves and trying to figure out what's actually happening in those cells. It's, it's, it's overwhelming, uh, even mm -hmm. to someone like me who kind of likes complexity. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that actually uh, is a great introduction to some of the ways we're trying to look at that complexity. Um, we have a collaboration with the Mayo Clinic where we're collecting uh, DNA from the blood, the germline DNA, DNA from lymphoma, and then very rigorous clinical information on patient volunteers who want to be part of this registry. Mm -hmm. We've now enrolled 6,000 people over 10 years in this. And what it's allowing us to do is go in and look and say, what genetic factor is associated with patients doing well, responding to a certain treatment, mm -hmm. or not responding to a certain treatment? Right. And you know, it's a gold mine. It's not something you do on an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah. And so we really do need to rely on our colleagues mm -hmm. to not only look at masses of data, but masses of very different data. There's clinical data, there's molecular genetic data, there's even imaging data. Mm -hmm. And so that creates a, a additional mm -hmm. challenges, but it's really opening our eyes to, to things that we couldn't have learned in other ways. Yeah, and I think you're making it clear that um, even though there, there might be an end in sight, you can see how you'll eventually get there. It's very frustrating for the patients who sign up to be, they want to take part in a clinical trial, they want to add whatever they can to the, you know, overall knowledge, but you don't get the answer tomorrow and you don't get the help perhaps in your lifetime. And we know that there will not be a cure for cancer. There are going to be mm. many, many cures for cancer. Yeah. And the harder we work, the more we'll find. Mm -hmm. um, will there be a day when we can cure each and every patient? I don't know. Yeah. But I do know actually we are making progress much faster than ever before. Hmm. And on a monthly basis, we, you can open a new journal and find uh, uh, a new gene and a new medication that's been made to target that gene. Um, we're starting to use them in combinations. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is a very, very exciting time in the field. Hmm. Yeah. And I think this is as good a time as any to mention the, the, uh, the actually, you know, it's easy to think about the computational challenges presented by all of this, or this genomic data. Um, they're very large data sets. They're, that data is generated by machines that are doing the sequencing. In fact, one of the most overwhelming um, sources of data right now is the clinic. And the uh, electronic, you know, health records or medical records that are now mandated um, seem like a great opportunity in, in the long term. Um, in fact, they look like a good opportunity in the short term, but in fact, they're turning out to be enormous challenges associated with um, not just, uh, you know, the, the volume of that data, and then there's the, the issues of privacy and, and how we can use this kind of data in, in studies without uh, compromising privacy and so on. Um, but there are also many different vendors that provide the, mm -hmm. the data services for storing that data. And then there's also the issues of different physicians um, call the same thing two or three different ways. And, uh, mm -hmm. and from, from a computational you know, person's point of view, who's used to you know, working in mathematical domains where um, something is something, and, <laughs> and, and just the, uh, you know, the sonic hedgehog is a good example. <laughs> um, the genes have been very kind of um, uh, named in a, in a rather interesting way, um, <laughs> to say the least, and, and that naming sometimes isn't even unique. 
uh, the same gene has been given yeah. several different names, and, yeah. and then it crosses over the other way. The same name has been used for two different genes, and so from the computer scientist's point of view or the engineer's point of view, it's a nightmare, and there are times when I just say, I want to just say, hey, you know, go clean it up before you give it to me, because mm -hmm. this is unusable, but mm -hmm. that's really not a valid way to, uh, <laughs> to respond. Yeah. What are some of the most successful, uh, the, the biggest successes in recent years that have uh, resulted from the genetics uh, research that's going on? You mentioned breast cancer. And sure. Well, I think one of the, the areas that really opened up our eyes to this field involved work that came from cytogeneticists who years ago, and the work was done in Philadelphia, identified an abnormal chromosome. So they called it the Philadelphia chromosome. Ah, yeah. And we knew that this was present in every patient with this kind of leukemia. <laughs> Well, over time, people were able to, to figure out what gene went haywire at that intersection, and then actually design medica medications that specifically blocked that gene, gene from behaving badly. The result is a pill that basically converts the leukemia cells to normal cells. Unbelievable. So whereas previously, these patients would have to undergo a bone marrow transplant, or they would convert to acute leukemia, and most of them would die, uh, now, people take two pills a day, and the vast majority of them have a normal lifespan. Mm. Now, what's, what's interesting is if they stop taking the medication, the leukemia comes back like that. We're still trying to find more examples like that. That's the sure. best ones. Sure. Um, but those are the types of examples and the progress that, that I see ahead. Mm. Yeah, and um, early, earlier and earlier diagnosis of cancer, I guess, uh, helps with anyone's prognosis? So, so earlier diagnosis does help. One of the other things we would like to be able to figure out is which cancers that we catch early are likely to cause trouble down the road mm -hmm. and which are not. And both in breast cancer and prostate cancer, for example, we know that some small cancers won't cause difficulty, so we really don't need to treat them. Mm -hmm. Others will. We don't know the difference right now, but genetics is going to tell us the difference. Yeah. So what we'll be able to do is do a biopsy of a prostate, for example, look at the genes of that, and then go to that gentleman and say, yes, you need therapy, or no, you don't need therapy, don't worry about it. Right. So that's another area where genetics will have an impact on early detection and therapy. Yeah. Well, and to spend just a second on prostate cancer, there's been so much in the news recently about the PSA tests. Should you even take them? Because at a given age, one might suspect that you'll die of something else before the very little bit of prostate cancer that, that seems to be indicated would in fact take your life. And so I, there's a lot of discussion. Should I take the test or if I've already taken the test and I have a number that I'm, I'm checking all the time? I, there's a lot of fear that comes just from getting, a, from getting a maybe not too bad result to the PSA, but it's still an indication that there's something in there and it lives in your, your head. So, you know, I, I don't know what you would advise, whether people should take that PSA test or whether they shouldn't. It's a very personal decision. Yeah. And I think what we encourage patients to do is sit down and talk to their doctor and think about what would they do if it's a little elevated, if it's not elevated, um, and before you get the test done, yeah. decide what you would do with the result. What you would do. Yeah. Uh, it's better to do it that way than to get the test and then start sc scratching your sure. head. Sure. Um, I don't get a PSA done, mm -hmm. and uh, other people do, and mm -hmm. uh, it's a personal decision. Yeah. Um, before we break here, uh, I'll just ask you if you, if you're, is there any part of this that gives you a little bit of fear about where we are, or where we're going? Sure. Well, I'm going to answer this a little differently than, than okay. the rest of the uh, panelists um, and say one thing that, that actually gives me fear is that our progress is going to be slowed. Um, uh, when, when Dan was talking about the government considering the funding for the NIH as being a hobby, well, the government might feel that way. Our cancer patients don't. Yeah, right. And we have a lot of teams of researchers who really rely on federal funding right now. And if that funding gets cut, those teams will take years to rebuild. Mm -hmm. So um, I am worried that with the current environment that we may mm -hmm. slow down or even reverse some of the progress we've made. Yeah. On a biological level, my greatest fear is that the genetics of cancer is going to prove to be so complex that it's really hard to convert it into better therapy for many patients. Hmm. Um, we should have a better idea of whether to, that's the case in the next few years, um, but, but that's another fear that, that it's not just one gene going haywire, it's many mm -hmm. of them, and figuring out how to use that to develop a better pa a treatment for every patient is gonna be very difficult. Sure.
and that those and that those genes work in complex networks where the same gene being different in these two patients may mm -hmm. behave very differently because a third gene is perhaps modifying or masking the effect of one of those and that's where the complexity comes in i mean the the, the beginning work that i um, contributed to in this area basically limited its, uh, its, its view to diseases that had single gene causes, mm -hmm. even though it was pretty well understood that that probably wasn't going to be the case with very many diseases, um, simply because that's all that we could deal with in terms yeah. of the complexity of the data. Yeah. Well, I think anyone who has had the opportunity to go to see a cancer center like the Holden Comprehensive Cancer Center, um, I was there with a family member for, for years, and each time I went in, it looked like there were more people than the time before. I mean, you are so busy trying to help people from all over the state, trying to get the right diagnosis, get the right treatment. I mean, it's, it must just sometimes... Uh, you know, worry you. Can, how can we keep this up? And then if there were funding issues or we, we lost researchers or, you know, it's, it's such a huge problem and needs such uh, direct intervention that, that um, you know, I think anybody who's benefited from the good work at the Cancer Center hopes that, that there won't be any disruptions in the work you do. Well, thank you very much. We yeah. have wonderful multidisciplinary teams yeah. and we work to do outstanding science to give personalized, uh, compassionate, state-of-the-art care for every patient that comes in the door. Yeah, it's really incredible. So thank you for taking your time to come here, George Wiener and, uh, and Tom Kassvand also, to talk about this very important area. Thanks. Thank you Appreciate very much. It. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Uh, so now I'm going to be in introducing a couple of other people to our, our stage. Uh, Barry Butler, University of Iowa Provost and former Dean of the College of Engineering is joining us now and uh, he'll be sitting here between Tom and Drew. And our other new guest is Andrew Kitchen, Associate Professor of Anthropology here at the University of Iowa and you work on genetics related to anthropology. So thank you, Drew, and thank you, Barry, for joining us. Thank you for having us. Yeah. I'd like to start with you, Barry. Um, as Provost of the University, you provide academic leadership to the entire campus. How can we, as an institution, uh, best train people for success in a field like this that's so rapidly evolving and really so important? Well, I think you've heard a lot of it already. You have some excellent panelists here who have um, demonstrated in this short program how um, interdisciplinary research is really what it takes to solve what, um, you know, the terminology that's been used are grand challenges. These are recognized um, by very esteemed groups of scientists around the world as problems that if we solve these, they're gonna really advance society. Mm -hmm. These are complex problems. They're not solved by an individual in an office uh, with a pen and paper. Mm -hmm. These are solved by teams who know how to work together. And um, mm -hmm. they're complex, there's no question about it, but, but even making advances like you just heard about in cancer and other areas, understanding uh, newborns, um, any advances that help society. So these so-called grand challenges clearly require us as an institution to understand that um, things are not siloed. Um, we, we can't solve these things in a single department with a single type of training. And so having faculty and leadership that understands that as we continually to evolve as an institution that we recognize this is part of what we should be doing as an institution. We should be training, educating, is a, probably a better word, mm -hmm. um, you know, future uh, leaders like you, you're interviewing here, mm -hmm. um, who have the ability to take on degrees and programs that allow them to learn a little bit more. You heard Tom, I think, and Val earlier mm -hmm. say how it took them a couple years to even communicate yeah. with one another. Yeah. And that, that's a common, that's very yeah. common. <laughs> and, um, you know, you think about that, and if you, if you could cut that down, you know, if you, if you had, if you, had uh, you know, newly educated scientists, engineers, mathematicians who had enough breadth in their training, uh, education, that they can communicate on day one, just, yeah. think of, just think of the advances, and we're seeing that now. So we have ins an institution that's pretty open to this. Faculty are very open to um, having broad-based educational programs that allow students to take a little more than perhaps in a siloed department. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's helping a lot. So I think, I think leading an institution that has uh, that willingness to think outside the traditional boundaries is, yeah. is very helpful. Yeah. 
Um, what does the University of Iowa do to accomplish uh, this kind of interdisciplinary training here um, on our campus, uh, across disciplines? How, how do we make that possible? I mean, do, does a professor like uh, Tom, is, is part of his workload, teaching load, divided in such a way that, because a lot of people, just for the pure passion of it, will work far beyond what anybody would consider a normal work week. I imagine that's the case with most of the people here tonight. But how do we really encourage graduate students and faculty to do this? Yeah, so it, it doesn't come from me, first of all. I mean, <laughs> that, that's something people have to understand, and I think people will know that. Uh, you know, the, the provost doesn't sort of dictate this is what's going to happen yeah. in, in academics. Faculty yeah. drive really what's happening. It's having faculty that are, that are um, smart, like we heard, you know, in terms of understanding what those problems are, but then develop academic programs that allow us to yeah. um, educate students that way. You know, typically, um, you know, a department uh, has uh, graduate sort of requirements for students within that discipline, and often uh, when you come up with these uh, grand challenge type problems, um, you, can, you can take a student within a department, say biology or mm -hmm. something, and and educate them broadly outside, a little bit outside the scope of the traditional sort of knowledge base, yeah. and that type of a person can contribute to the type of research that you're hearing about. But that doesn't always work. There, there's, you know, if you think about genetics, you've mm -hmm. heard already the, the broad range of, of, of information that flows into um, the type of research that goes on. I mean, you had a, uh, an electrical engineer sitting here and a genetics mm -hmm. person and others, yeah. and, and if you kept going, you'd have mathematicians, mm -hmm. public policy experts. So on campus, we, um, we do have interdisciplinary graduate programs that have evolved this mm -hmm. way. Faculty get together and say, you know, it just doesn't fit within a given, a given department or a given silo. Um, we need to think a little broader than that. And so we have about eight different uh, programs in, mm -hmm. that are housed in the graduate college mm -hmm. under Dean John Keller. Um, they are, in, in essence, uh, faculty come from all different academic uh, departments to define what it takes to receive a PhD, a graduate degree in that area. Yeah. And so they're driven by the faculty, they're interdisciplinary, and uh, those programs are, are the, the ones you're, you're hearing about mm -hmm. now, and, mm -hmm. and they have contributed a lot to this campus. Yeah. Um, they're driven by the faculty, they're ultimately um, approved by the faculty that are parts of these, uh, these groups, and I will tell you that the students that go through these um, are getting uh, a, a tremendous education and in in really a, a step forward in being able to contribute to solving some of these problems of the world. Yeah. Well, and speaking of the world, you, you do an awful lot of travel now. I know you did as the Dean of the College of Engineering, but I know you've just come back from India and you do a lot of international collaboration and work. What, what is the... Um, what does international collaboration in the fields of, of science and genetics research look like now? Well, you heard a little bit earlier from, uh, from Val, and I think that was a very good example, actually, of where uh, an individual such as he has to, uh, well, has decided to work with individuals in other parts of the world um, for that particular scientific edge mm -hmm. that he needed, yeah. and uh, to be able to work with uh, scientists from, from different backgrounds mm -hmm. is very important. The one thing I would say, and I don't have evidence to really back this other than just sort of observing when I go around and visit universities, particularly in the Pacific Rim, I think we in America and here at the University of Iowa, uh, because we're a major comprehensive research university uh, and we bring all these disciplines together under one roof, mm -hmm. um, we have this ability to do the kinds of things you're hearing about tonight. Mm -hmm. you know, we have the ability for a, a professor in mathematics to walk you know, what, 300 yards across the river and sit down with a person who's an expert in, in cancer with an MD or an MD and a PhD. We have that ability and we also have the flexibility within our system that allows people to do it. Yeah. And uh, that's, pretty, that's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, y there's a lot of universities around the world, very well regarded universities, uh, that are very narrow, I'll mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think this is traditionally how they're developed. You know, there, there's, there's a lot of for example, universities that are just nothing but engineering, mm. and they're very good. These are, these are some top universities. Um, but if you're talking about solving the kinds of problems we're, we're addressing tonight, mm -hmm. and you heard how the electrical engineer sitting to my right works with uh, people from medicine and so mm -hmm. on, um, those sort of interactions are hard to accomplish. I'm not saying it's everywhere, but mm -hmm. I think our system and how we've established you know, these comprehensive research universities in this country and how the University of Iowa is a, is a major player in that, I think uh, sets the tone for how you go about solving problems like this. I really like the system and the sort of a 
way we've evolved as an institution. Mm -hmm. and, and as uh, Vice President Reed mentioned earlier, you know, to have the humanities 100 yards away in another building, right. you know, that you can bring someone in to talk about some of the societal issues. How does mm -hmm. this impact us down the road? Mm -hmm. That's something that is just superb. And I think that's what we as an institution and other universities in America have to offer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Uh, so much for that. Well, let me move to um, Drew Reed. Uh, Drew Reed. I'm sorry, Drew Kitchen. And uh, hi, so nice to meet you. And I know that you're, you've recently come here as an anthropology professor. Very, uh, very uh, good to meet you. And uh, tell us about the very interesting work you do related to genetics and uh, anthropology. Yeah, well, I, let me start off by saying that um, I guess I embody this interdisciplinarity because I started out as a biomedical engineer and computer scientist as an <laughs> undergraduate. And then I went through biology to anthropology, at, um, and here I am. And so what I'm interested in, what got me interested in genetics, was using genetics as a tool initially to s answer questions about human history. And then as I got more and more comfortable with genetics, I became to, to think of genetics as both a tool and a primary source of research. And so everything you study is both a tool and a, sort, and, and a piece of research in and of itself. And so it's the application of that and also the basic the basic research into that tool can tell you both things. So I study human population history um, using DNA to look at ancient migration events, um, origins of populations, how big populations were when they moved. I also study human infectious disease to figure out using the genetics of the actual pathogens to figure out when they entered human populations. But to, to understand that, I also have to understand the evolution of those pathogens themselves. I have to also understand the evolution of human DNA. And so I get into the basic research of pathogen evolution, um, the determinants of how pathogens evolve, mutation rates, substitution rates, and these things. And so I'm really enjoying being in the anthropology department because I get it, anthropology is humanities, social science, and, bio, and biology and the sciences all in one department. And so I can, ask, I can ask all these questions. I could read a novel and I could study genetics and mm -hmm. go in and, and um, do run simulations, and it all counts for me. Yeah. And so that's kind of what's really fascinating about this. I, I, I really enjoy, I'm, I'm across the river, and I'm throughout the university um, yeah. in my connections. Yeah. Let me go back to what you were explaining earlier and see if I got it right. Did you say that you're studying population movement based in some cases on diseases? that have been carried by p populations and... Yeah, that's one of um, my long-term interests, actually. That was one of my first interests in graduate school. And so there's this idea that you can trace population movements, because when people populations move, they take their pathogens with them. Yeah. And so in some cases, this can tell you things that um, isn't clear from the human genetic data. And so uh, I've been using, um, I've been interested, long interested in using pathogens as markers of these events and behavior. And so I've done some work on um, for example, human lice is probably the, the most kind of successful work I've done in this, is that you can, um, humans carry two, three types of lice. So you have pubic lice, and then you have head slash body lice. And um, body lice actually live in human clothing. And so there's no real genetic marker of when humans start using clothing. But if you know when human, human body slash clothing lice appeared, you know when humans start using clothing. So this is one example of trying to, <laughs> trying to figure out, the, using the ecology of infectious disease, to figure out when human behaviors occurred in the past. And then also, if you know how the ecology of infectious disease, you could figure out how changing human behaviors in the present can, can affect the distribution of infectious yeah. disease. Yeah, that's the most interesting description of lice I've ever heard. I, I didn't know they were good for anything. <laughs> uh, so, um, so you find yourself discussing genetics and various things with people all around campus in various different departments, as you were oh, saying. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm, you know, I'm an engineer, and I'm, I'm guest lecturing in Tom's course coming up soon mm -hmm. um, in computational biology. I work with biologists. I work with anthropologists. I have a student in one of my classes who's actually at the Iowa Writers Workshop who <laughs> wants to know about genetics, and she writes science fiction. And so uh -huh. I, um, and I've been working with geneticists at the med school. And so I work. Mm -hmm. uh, Genetics is, is a thing in the world now, and so, um, you know, that's really interesting for me to actually interact. It allows me to interact with a lot of different individuals that you wouldn't expect. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, Drew is, is part of the uh, genetics cluster hire, mm -hmm. which was one of the intentional university initiatives um, to try to focus on an area um, which wouldn't be able to um, be satisfied by doing hiring in one department or right. even two departments. Um, it's right. literally the, the intention of that. And, 
Barry doesn't take any credit for it, but in <laughs> fact the provost's office is driving this, this mm -hmm. mechanism for hiring faculty that will have joint appointments, that will have membership in this cluster of faculty um, in addition to their normal faculty appointments. And, and Drew's a great example of that. It, <laughs> Drew is one of those people that remind, makes me realize that I'm getting old because he's one of these young people that I'm so excited about and I, and I just have a million questions for him. I'd, I have a question for him. I'd put him on the spot <laughs> now, but, but you're uh, the question. No, please, here. no, no. Well, I, I'm a big fan of, of reading history and biography and I've been reaching, reading about the migrations um, from Africa. And uh, there are bits and pieces of uh, um, evidence that maybe the pyramids in Central America had some relationship to the pyramids in, in Africa. And I, I was uh, talking with one of my graduate students the other day about possibly looking at DNA and seeing if we could find a second branch of evidence for that. And do you, can you shoot this idea I down or has it already been done? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Tom. Um, I'm gonna have to say that's probably unlikely. Uh, <laughs> those populations have been separated for um, probably, you know, 40,000 years, 50,000 years at least. That's when out of Africa probably occurred. And so, and, and people didn't come to the Americas until about 15,000 years ago. I, I've done a lot, um, a lot of my research focused on people in the Americas. But there's interesting research that just came out um, recently looking at the origins of sweet, sweet potatoes, not my work, but right. in, in, across Oceania. And so looking at historical connections between South America and some of the Melanesian islands. And it turns out that within the last couple thousand years, people from Oceania were in South America and moving back and forth. Uh -huh. And so this is an interesting way in which genetics can actually connect, show historical connections that aren't immediately obvious and mm -hmm. using other. And that's, that's pretty awesome because yeah. at least Magellan had the wind behind him. Those yeah. people had to go into the wind. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it just shows that how, how amazing um, humans are in terms of, you know, seeking out new things and mm -hmm. discovering. Yeah. Are there challenges in bringing the study of genetics into um, the humanities or social um, sciences? Yes, there are, there are some challenges. Um, and I will say the least one of those is interest. Um, students are very, very interested in this. Um, I have students all the time. What's challenging is sometimes that getting that up to speed of it. Genetics is becoming more and more um, a mathematical, uh, oh, yeah. a mathematical profession, um, and, and interest, and so, and it's also becoming uh, requiring more and more algorithmic thinking in the ways of how you solve this, because data are becoming greater and greater, and that there's a problem um, with dealing with these large data, and then also with the nature of research, you're doing something new, and you want to do something that hasn't been done before, which often there's not a program for that will just do exactly what you want to do. So you have to know a little bit how to program a bit, how to think mathematically a bit to get what you want done mm -hmm. in a quick way. And so in the humanities, uh, typically people think, I'm gonna go in the humanities, I'm gonna study history, I don't need to know math. And, and that's often the case, but in reality, it can be very, very useful to do so. And students often have a block against it, but then once you invite them to, to look at the genetics, look at the math, they realize that it's not as nearly as difficult as they thought it was. And that's kind of one of the, one of the issues. Um, the plus side is that I'm exposed to all these fantastic ideas about history and the way genetics kind of, we think of genetics being in this lab, but then it's a thing in the world and how, what, you know, how, how is it picked up in public policy? How do people think about it? Um, why do people have these entirely different views of um, something that we see as a fact? Why do two different groups act on that is a very different way. Mm -hmm. And so I've been exposed to a lot of that, which is kind of, which more than makes up for um, any kind of deficiencies. But, but, yeah. but interest is the key. They're very, everyone, everyone is very interested in this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but sometimes the math is hard. Yeah. <laughs> no, and, it's and, there's, and there isn't any way around it. And I, and, I, and I say that because it was a lesson I've learned in just the last few years that um, as I, in addition to the research that, you know, we've worked on together as a, as a group, uh, you know, across the medical school and, and here, um, have developed a training program, an interdisciplinary training program in bioinformatics. And there's a lot of excited students who think that that's really where the, uh, where they really want to work, but then every now and then there are students who kind of hit that wall where it's it's not it's not simple. I mean, there are cases where you can understand it, you can have an intuitive sense for it, but then there are times when it, it simply gets very complex. Mm -hmm. And um, trying to attract uh, students to to be sustained in that program 
there's a second level of filtering that goes on. And achieving success at the output of that training program has been, frankly, a little more challenging than, uh, yeah. than we thought it would be when we got the grant from NIH to establish the program. Um, getting the students to kind of stick with all of the requirements. Um, it's, it's a new area and there are not a lot of, um, they don't have a lot of other students to kind of look to who've been down that mm -hmm. path because it is really a fairly untrodden path. Yeah. So I was anticipating the what do you fear question. Yeah. I, I, you asked it for the last <laughs> several yes, groups. But it's right here. I, it's, it, no, 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 it's exactly what Tom is saying. Yeah. You know, as, a, as an academic institution, when you look at all of the advances that can be made with the type of people that you've been interviewing tonight, and you look at the, uh, the future, th these are problems that are going to take, you know, a long time to solve. Yeah. Um, you hope it's not a long time, but the reality is that mm -hmm. these will take a long time to solve. And having that pipeline of, of new people coming in to, to take their seats, you know, the mm -hmm. next generation of faculty, the next generation of mm -hmm. researchers, that we play a role in making sure through programs like Tom is discussing mm -hmm. to, to not scare away um, youth, mm -hmm. uh, that yes, these people up on the stage are pretty highly educated and they know a lot about what they're doing and they've made some incredible advances. And, but, um, but everybody starts at some level, and yeah. just having an interest in it and not being mm -hmm. scared away. So there are a number of programs like Tom is describing where we go out and try to, to work with youth and, and get them interested and get them in the pipeline, so to speak, so sure. that uh, when we're ready to retire, uh, there'll be another generation of people coming along. Mm -hmm. And that's very important to the country yeah. that we have that, and to the world, you know, that we have that next generation mm -hmm. out there. So this would even be part of the, the STEM initiative, correct, right? Yes. To, to make sure that kids are interested in science, exposed to, important science math exactly. whatever early exactly. on. Exactly, yeah. it's, it's so, so important. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any fears I didn't ask you? Uh, um, yeah, well, I guess I, I have, uh, I'll use somebody else's fears. One is over interpretation. Hmm. And so, um, and not just in the sense of risk, but the sense of allowing, allowing genetics to have too much control over the way yeah. we think about things. Identity, perhaps, um, you know, and, and this is kind of maybe my, where my, interactions with the humanities may play a little role, is understanding that genetics is incredibly important, but there's also a limit to it. We get to control, like, you know, through our policies, through our, mm -hmm. through our belief systems, um, how it functions and how it works in society. And so I think that's, that's a, um, kind of my fears that we'll, we'll let it go as opposed to try to, try to actually have a discussion about where it should be and what's possible mm -hmm. with it, instead of letting it just go as, you know, it's just science, let mm -hmm. it go. Well, science is a tool and, you know, mm -hmm. an object of research in itself. So. Well, and I think lots of people are um, aware of the anthropologists who are cultural anthropologists who are studying, mm -hmm. you know, how people live or have lived as societies as, as um, you know, living people rather than the, the folks you're trying to trace through some of these yeah. ancient times. And, and we aren't only our genes, right? We're also... No the people we are based on the places we live, the foods we eat, the families we're raised in, and all of those things. So yeah. sort of everything in perspective, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, just to touch on something that we haven't talked about yet was epigenetics and um, environmental factors on genetics. It could be an amazing interest, it's an amazing area of policy concern in the future because you get these inherited effects like stress um, that takes several generations to actually decay. And so, that has huge policy concerns and humanities concerns and how we deal with um, these effects. Yeah. So. Wow. Well, thank you. Andrew Kitchen, Barry Butler, thank you. And thank you, Tom. Appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thanks. So now I'd like to welcome our final guests. I'm uh, very anxious to get to this segment with the uh, three people who will be coming up to join us. Now we're going to be discussing some of the ethical, social, and legal issues related to genetics and new technologies with uh, these three guests. We have at the far end Josephine Gittler, who's the Wiley B. Rutledge Professor of Law and Director of the National Health Law and Policy Resource Center. And thank you for being here, Josie. appreciate it. Next to her is Diana Cates. And uh, Diana is a professor of religion ethics and she's the chair of the Department of Religious Studies. Thank you for coming. And uh, just next to me here is uh, Sandy Doc Hirsch, assistant professor in the College of Nursing. And thank you. So Diana, uh, I thought that I would go to you first and <laughs> I'm sorry, were you trying to say something? No. <laughs> um, I wanted to go to you first to talk um, about 
the ethical implications of all these things you've been talking about tonight. I mean, obviously, it's not something we can address in a whole week of conversation, but give me your top line thoughts about what, if, what the, the ethical issues are in these dis uh, discoveries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the ethical issues are so complex, maybe as complex as some of the programs that uh, Tom is trying to develop. I'm actually most interested in the role that religion plays in shaping people's ethical sensibilities and their ethical decision making. There are lots of ways we could talk about various principles of ethics or aspects of character or aspects of rational decision making and so on, but I think in reality uh, it's important for us to realize that most people in our communities do see the world through a particular lens. They see it in light of well, it's as if they see the world as a symbolic world. Um, very difficult to describe, but I think when people look at the experiments that are being done and the technologies that are being developed, they literally see different things. And it's not that they see different things with their eyes, it's that they really do interpret the significance of events differently. And so it's important, I think, that we recognize those differences. And there, and there is a tendency on the part of scientists to uh, have um, relatively narrow views of what religion is and um, be relatively suspicious that religious people um, are going to be interfering with the progress of their science. Uh, but in fact, um, there are lots of uh, religious people who are very excited about the science, but also realize that um, there are some really huge questions that arise uh, when looking at these uh, developments. And so let me just indicate that um, I, I, I wanna suggest that uh, people have something like a religious dimension of their humanity and that this we can think of this as a um, second like inclination to ask certain big questions about what's really going on in the universe, what's going on under the surface of things, and how did this all get to be, and why is it, and why am I here? So I think those are ethical questions, but they're also religious questions, and I think they're questions that most of us have. Some of us answer them in terms of traditional religious uh, communities, languages, and other people are on more individualized and s searches for the right language to articulate their concerns, but those ought not to be neglected. Mm -hmm. um, you've mentioned religion, you've mentioned sort of spiritual dimension and, and so on, but um, can, can you sort of give a reaction to, um, suppose someone came to talk to you, uh, maybe you're a former professor or something, and they, they have encountered a problem that they're, they're having here, and they have to face a really serious question um, uh, for themselves or for a child or something. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how would you go about helping somebody come to, a, if you wanted to, uh, come to some sort of um, path forward, you know, how to make sense of what information they've been giving, how to come to a decision on care that they might choose to take or might choose not to take. Well, I think the most important thing is to listen, you know, rather than presume that you know uh, what somebody's thinking, or because they're a Christian or because they're a Jew, you can presume what they believe. So uh, people are extraordinarily individual and unique, and in order to learn what that is, we have to treat them as uh, other uh, of the guests were saying, as persons, very deep, mysterious beings uh, who are way more than their genes, and even uh, for many people, more than their genes in interaction with their environment. So um, I think that listening is important, and I think uh, one needs to listen with compassion. This is part of what the humanities do. They. Uh, not only explore intellectually what it means to be human, but they somehow uh, allow us to cultivate our humanity, cultivate our human and moral sensibilities. 
So I think the more broadly we are educated, especially at places like the University of Iowa, the more likely we're going to be able to sit quietly and listen with compassion to someone's concerns. And uh, the, the answer is not to provide people with the language that they need to answer the questions. Um, I think the answer is to encourage them to find a wide range of resources that could help them find that language. But uh, especially in genetic counseling, I think uh, it's um, dangerous to put words in people's mouth. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to leave them completely stumped as to what to yeah. even think about their yeah. situation. Yeah. Well, you've led us into a conversation with uh, Sandy Duck Hirsch, and you're from the College of Nursing. Right. And uh, tell us what, what you do. Uh, what do you teach? Uh, what area do you teach with your students? So I teach clinical genetics with nursing students, and my clinical background was providing genetic counseling um, to families who had um, neuromuscular children with neuromuscular disorders or craniofacial birth defects. Um, you know, and, and my research area is actually um, with a public public perspective on um, how this information might be used or what does it mean to them or how should they have access or um, you know who who uh, who, who determines um, what they should know and um, so um, it, it's it, it, so what your comments are really just beautiful because of what we've learned with the research with the public is that, you know, we're talking about personalized medicine at the cellular level, and they want personalized medicine at the human level. So um, it's one thing to know what at the cellular level this disorder or this disease mean, but when you give that information back to me, you have to consider all the other things that I am. You know, I'm a mother, I'm a daughter, um, I, I have to work, um, I don't have time off to deal with this, I have to deal with bills, um, my religious faith, my yeah. other background make a big difference into how I might use that information or how personal that is mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you help your nursing students understand an approach to any number of patients? So first I think they have to recognize that um, people are, you know, d different, cellular mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. as a human being, and that they um, need to have access to the information um, that they need to make the decision. And then I think other people have brought this up as well, that you encourage people to think about what this information might mean to them before they're put on the spot to make the decision. Yeah. So if you have this information, what, what will it mean for you? What, was, what would the next decision be that you, you know, would have to sort of think about if you had this information? And that you know, the, the decision you make today may be different um, um, a week from now or yeah. a month from now because that information is going to change mm -hmm. or how you feel about that information is going to change. So you make the best decision with the information you have available today, mm -hmm. but it's our job to link you to that, mm -hmm. where to find that information. And nurses really throughout, throughout uh, uh, if there's a, a long treatment period for an illness, nurses are the real point of contact, not that the doctors aren't incredibly important, but you may spend more time with the nurses, right. they may be the person you, so, so it's an incredibly important field, and I'm sure that every nurse takes this very, very seriously. Do you sometimes hear back from your nursing students that they really have a lot of sort of um, real ethical or emotional struggles with what they have to do? Yeah, you know, this has been a challenge not just for nurses, but medical education, dental education, all of the healthcare fields, is to educate practitioners on um, how to utilize this information as well. And I think that students have struggled with this. This is a futuristic thing. Yeah. It's not going to impact the care that I give today. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, we'll send all patients to the genetics clinic. But these are things that are happening in, you know, across the board in all of healthcare. And so um, our students are coming back uh, and saying, you know, I didn't think that that lecture was going to um, mm -hmm. impact the question I asked or my, you know, I. Um, or, or what I might be talking about with the patient today, but they're seeing um, this put into play on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. I, I'm going to go now to Josie Gittler mm -hmm. from the College of Law, and uh, you're a professor of law, and you've worked at national level on such things as health management and policy, children, family law, delivery of services for children and families. Um, what are the legal and public policy implications of genetics research in the last yeah. six minutes of our show? <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, for law and public policy uh, posed by um, the, what's been discussed here yeah. uh, tonight. Uh, 
I think it's fair to say in general that the enormous advances uh, that we've seen in genetics and genetic technologies and the enormous advances that I expect are, are to come mm -hmm. are leaping ahead of the well-established legal and public policy frameworks in many areas, mm -hmm. uh, ahead of the capacity of those frameworks to, to deal with them. And there is an ongoing debate as to how public policymakers uh, can and should respond to these uh, advances. Um, there are just so many issues that are raised by these advances that it's, it's hard to know where to, to start, particularly when we have just mm -hmm. a few minutes. But let me just mention um, two sets of uh, issues that are related but distinct um, that are of a legal public policy nature that have received a great deal of attention and that have been alluded to by some of the previous panelists. Um, legal protection for privacy and confidentiality of genetic information and uh, legal protection against discri genetic uh, discrimination. Uh, first, um, genetic privacy mm -hmm. and confidentiality. You know, when I talk to people about that, I like to ask them, um, these kinds of questions. If, if you found out as a result of genetic testing that you had a genetic predisposition to a serious disease, who would you want to know? Who would you want to have know about it? You know, your family, your friends, your colleagues at work, your employer, mm -hmm. uh, your health insurer. Um, what if you participated in a research project and your uh, DNA sequencing data, along with those of many other people, was collected and put in a data bank and was disseminated um, via the internet um, for research purposes, and you had been assured that it was not individually identifiable, um, but you found out that maybe under some circumstances you could be identified from that data. How would, you, how would you feel about that? So those questions kind of, I think, get us to focus mm -hmm. on issues of privacy mm -hmm. and confidentiality. And we ha have laws now that protect uh, what's called personal health information. Mm -hmm. um, there are significant protections for personal health information. Those laws apply to genetic information, but nevertheless, there are some that would argue that genetic information is so uniquely private um, that it is deserving of special legal protections um, for, for various um, reasons. And increasingly, public policymakers are giving consideration to extending special legal protections to um, genetic information. But it's just like everybody keeps saying, you know, this is complicated. Well, this is complicated. Um, because depending on the nature and extent of legal protections that you give to genetic information of individuals, um, it, there is a potential sometimes to hinder uh, genetic uh, research uh, discoveries. So public policymakers mm -hmm. have to balance the need to protect mm -hmm. genetic privacy and confidentiality yeah. and at the same time promote research um, discoveries in genetics that will mm -hmm. hopefully lead to better patient care and benefit society mm -hmm. as a whole. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not easy. And then let me t mention just very briefly the other related but distinct set of issues and that's genetic discrimination. There's a long-standing um, concern that um, people who have a genetic predisposition to diseases and conditions, um, if that becomes known, they'll be subject to um, discrimination. Particularly, there's concern about in an insurance context and mm -hmm. an employment context. So in recently as 2008, um, there was federal legislation enacted called the genetic, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> genetic, 
Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, GINA, that does attempt to protect people against genetic discrimination, but um, it remains to be seen how effective it's going to be in deterring mm -hmm. health insurers and employers from engaging in genetic discrimination, mm -hmm. and it doesn't cover all situations. So these are just like two sets of mm -hmm. issues, and there are many, many more um, sure. issues of illegal and public policy nature that are, mm -hmm. that are coming about because of what's occurring with advances mm -hmm. in genetics and, and genetic technology. Well, one thing we're, we're all aware of and thinking about all the time is the, the new health care uh, law in the country, what, what will happen <coughs> next with health care. And um, one question seems to me, uh, if, if the human genome can be, every individual human genome can be, uh, uh, you know, provided back to you at a cost, if the cost comes down to $1,000, $800, $500, and it becomes kind of routine testing, who pays for that? I mean, I think there are questions about who, as a patient, will actually have access to some of the potentially, you know, helpful uh, therapies that George was mentioning earlier. Um, I know that certainly a number of people who are seen by our hospitals and clinics are, are not covered by private health insurance. And I don't know any of the details about what's covered and what's not covered um, for those patients. But, but I think we all think about, you know, the huge impact on our personal finances if someone in our family became dreadfully ill. Now, if, if you can have the test and that somehow gives you answers that take away the worry about, about a certain illness, they wouldn't necessarily take away all worries about all illnesses, but still that, that test might be considered to be a very important thing. And what if you don't have the money to pay for it? What kind of care then are you offered? Uh, so, so that's my biggest fear. Um, is that our health system is uh, in such a way that um, that people may not have access because of the inequity and in access and the ability to pay and, and it's not a uniform way in which we um, can have access to some of this testing and that it will create disparities um, that we didn't intend to do. We intend that you know that this information is going to target therapies and diagnostics so that you know we better the health of people but um, when the testing is put out in, you know, direct-to-consumer modes or methods, mm -hmm. um, you know, that limits the people who can and cannot have access to that information or, you know, even follow up on that information to talk with their health care provider about. Right. right. Um, in our last minute or so here, would you, of you care to say something about a fear you have about where we are now in this life cycle? Uh, I would say my fear is something that's been articulated already, which is that the science and engineering will outpace our ability, both as members of society in unique cultures around the world, and also as persons uh, with uh, unique and complex uh, psychologies um, to understand the implications of this. And it's very dangerous, I think, to um, um, get into a position where there's a risk that the science and engineering will be like this uh, runaway train mm -hmm. and uh, we'll never be able to catch up with it because um, that can only lead to uh, the injury of human beings and the increase of human suffering. Thank you, Diana. Josie, what about you? Well, I'm an optimist. I, I, <laughs> I think that um, the promise of of what's occurring with genetics and genetic technology is, is just so great. And yes, uh, it brings problems with it, uh, sometimes uh, legal po problems, uh, public policy problems, ethical problems, but I think we can address them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good note to end on. Thank you. So you've been listening to Josephine Gittler and to Diana Cates and Sandy Doc Hirsch. And thank you so much for being here. But don't get up and leave yet. I'll just say goodbye for the program. And then um, thank all of our guests for being here tonight. This is World Canvas. And I'm Joan Kerr. I'm very happy you could join us here in this room. And anybody watching this program, if uh, you would like to catch it again, it will be available in many venues, iTunes, Public Radio Exchange, and on UITV. Uh, we also will have the program posted 
posted on our website, which is international.uiowa.edu slash world canvas. So please join us for our next program in this series. It's March 8th in this room, again at 5 o'clock, and uh, the topic is the book culture, languages, and arts of indigenous peoples. And I want to say thank you to my production colleagues from international programs, also the folks from UITV, and that's it for this edition of World Canvas. Thank you for coming, and see you next time. Good night.